Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Overeaters Anonymous Special Focus 100 Pounder Meeting. Today is Wednesday, the 23rd of February, 2022, and we're absolutely delighted to have our speaker, Katie V, with us. Katie got abstinent in Brooklyn, New York, and is currently living in Orange County, California. Katie came into the rooms of OA in June 2020. So it's over to my neighbor in Orange County, Katie, now to share her experience, strength, and hope. It's all yours, Katie. Oh, boy. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie. I am a uh, recovered impulsive overeater, and um, I'm super nervous. <laughs> um, like Paul so uh, wonderfully mentioned in that awesome introduction, um, I came in in June 2020. My uh, abstinence date is August of 2020, August 5th, and um, I have a sponsor and I commit a meal plan daily. I do a, an 11th, 10th step, whatever you want to call it, every night to her, and um, I work with others because this program tells me I have to. Uh, if I want to stay well. And I do um, because it was pretty bad before. And just to qualify so that you guys all know that I uh, belong here with you. Um, let's see. Let's see here if I can screen share. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. There we go. Nice. It won't let me do it, but um, whatever. I um, at my basically I started compulsively eating when I was a kid. And, uh, by the time I was 20 years old, I was 350 pounds and I can just throw it in the chat for anyone who doesn't believe me. Um, and I'll just put a little photo in there for you. Um, but, um, anyway, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I started binging when I was a kid and, um, I was just always obsessed with food, you know, um, everywhere I went, it was kind of about what I ate. I was always looking at what other people were eating. Um, I, uh, I went places, I made friends, I did things all centered around food. It was always about what am I going to eat when I get there? Um, you know, what's going to be on the table at the birthday party. And it really didn't matter who was there as long as there was food there. Because I, um, from a really young age, just did not accept myself for who I was, you know, and it was, it was like, I didn't like myself, but also that it, it, it I was just wrong. Like there was something fundamentally wrong about being me and I needed something to numb that pain because I was just always on the outside always not like you in some way, always, you know, separate and apart from, and, um, and that, you know, that today I know is my disease. Like it's my disease early on that just made me different from you instead of just being another human being, you know, at five years old, I'm like, well, I'm different from all the other five-year-olds here. You guys don't get me, but I'm different. And, um, and that's how I lived. And I, I lived in a lot of fear of being found out, found out about what, like, who knows, but I was always in fear of being found out and, and, um, found out of being myself. And I grew up just with really poor self-esteem and, um, and that fear, you know, it just came out in my food. And I was always like a stuffer. I stuffed all my feelings. I still do. It's really, it's really just, it's awful. It's a character defect and it's getting better. But like I stuffed everything down because I had to always be accepted by you. So if I was going to be accepted by you, then I couldn't be honest with you because I needed to be whoever you wanted me to be in that moment. And, um, you know, when I was sad, I ate, when I was happy, I ate, when I was, you know, angry. I ate when I was worried. I ate, I ate all the time and I just needed to be chewing something always. So I, I grew up, you know, um, stealing food from people, you know, taking a bite, running into the cupboard. And my mom's like, what are you doing in there? And I, meanwhile, I'm eating like all the red vines in the, in the Tupperware. And like, I just, I had to be eating anytime I felt a feeling 
And, um, and by the time I was 20 years old, like I said, and if you can see the chat, I, um, I was 350 pounds and wearing a size 24 going up to a 26. And, and I had, you know, it was a point of pride for me, like to be overweight because I was like, yeah, screw you. I am who I am and you're going to deal with it. Right. Like no matter what size I was, um, because I thought the world was against me for my weight and for who I was. So I had to be the loudest, funniest, smartest person in the room because I did not like the way I looked so much. And, but I didn't let anybody onto that because I felt like that would be, um, you know, its own failure, right? No, I'm happy with who I am and who I, and in the inside, I'm just screaming, right. Just suffering. And, um, and so, um, by the time I was 20, I, um, I got, medical news that I, it would probably be unlikely that I have kids because of how overweight I was. And I had always wanted kids because I had a really hard relationship with my mom about my weight and my eating. And, um, and because of that, um, you know, I, I thought if I had kids that I would, it would kind of redo, it would kind of, you know, change the past, right? Like I would no longer, have that suffering. Like I would, I would rewrite history. Like my mom would no longer be sending me to a personal trainer when I was 11, starving me when I was in high school and giving me a bag of nuts and saying, don't eat anything else all day. You know, it would, I would then treat a child the way I always wanted to be treated. And, um, and when I lost that reality, um, I just fell apart, you know, and I stopped eating and I started using substances and, I started losing weight, funnily enough. Um, and uh, the next time I got on a scale, like for like four months, five months later, and um, I was, I was 70 pounds lighter. And I was like, what is this about? And that kind of started my, my stint with anorexia and bulimia. And um, I lost 200 pounds in two years. And I thought that I was going to be happy once that happened, because for me growing up, I always thought like, like thin equals happy, thin equals loved. If, if I was thin, my mom would love me. If I was thin, the world would love me. You know, I wouldn't be bullied anymore. I wouldn't be, you know, I'd, I'd get a, you know, a partner and I'd be happy, you know, and everyone else would see me and they would approve of me and I would approve of myself. And what happened was that um when i i was 150 pounds and i'm 5'10 so i was like skin and bones and i um i got on the scale that day that i was you know i hit that weight because the scale had become my god i was on the scale every single morning it was like if the scale told me if i was going to have a good day or a bad day and i got on that scale that day and i was like i just i got i got i saw the number and i was like oh you know, wow. Like that's the number I've been wanting this whole time, my entire life to be this number, right? Not, not this person, this number. And, um, and I got in the shower and I just heard this booming voice that, that was like, it's not enough. You still hate yourself. And I just broke down. And I was like, if, if my, if my weight isn't the answer, then what is? because I can't live like this anymore. Like I'm miserable. And I was during that whole stint of anorexia and bulimia, like I'm binging all the time. And then I'm running on the treadmill for three hours and I'm taking laxatives and I'm chewing gum until I got aspartame poisoning because I need to be chewing something. And I'm, I'm chugging seltzer and I'm eating cough drops till I get like menthol burning in the back of my throat. Like I am suffering so much. And like to get to this weight and not be happy, I was like, well, then life doesn't mean anything because when I was before this program, my life was I'm thin and I'm happy or I'm overweight and I'm sad. Like that's it. And my life was about what I weighed and what you weighed. And I was constantly measuring myself against other people, you know, and, um, and it was so small and so dark. I had no room for having a relationship, having any sort of relationships. I had no room to have responsibilities. It was about what am I eating next? What's on my plate? What's on your plate? What's my dress size? And what's your dress size? And that's it. That's all I thought about 24 seven. 
And when I got here, um, you know, kicking and screaming really. And because I, I didn't want to be here because I didn't, I didn't want to admit that I couldn't control my food. And it was, it was pretty obvious. Like it had been obvious for a long time that I could not control anything about the food. Um, and I, I just, when I came here, I said, you know, I lost 200 pounds on my own, right? On my own, I lost 200 pounds. What are these people going to tell me about losing weight? Because when I came here, I thought this was a weight loss program. I thought that we were all just here to get on diets and cry to each other about how we just ate a whole pizza. You know, like I thought that's what was the point of this program. And I am so glad that I was 100% wrong. This is not a diet club. This is not like, oh, I get on a meal plan and like my life is fine. Because for me, I, I get abstinent and my life gets worse. Because for me, the food was always the solution to my problem, the solution to my fear, my dishonesty, my selfishness, my, my boredom, you know, my feelings, period. It was always the solution. You know, food could either take me up, take me down, numb me, you know, whatever it was, it could do it. But it was killing me. And every single bite that I was taking was getting me closer and closer to an early grave. And um, and so I to finish that, you know, the story is I lost, you know, that 200 pounds and I couldn't keep it off, you know, because two weeks later I was going back up. I was 10 pounds heavier. And by the time I came back in June, 2020, I was 80 pounds up from that weight. And I felt like I was going to tear my skin off because I could see becoming 350 pounds again, very quickly in, in the, you know, in the future. And I was like, there's no way. Oh, thank you. That's, that's me. Wow. Somebody did it. That's me. I, that is how I qualify with you guys. Um, that was me, not even at my heaviest, um, with a, a friend at a party and, um, and, uh, yeah, sorry. I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, so I was super wrong about this program. And I got here in June of 2020 and um, Rita hooking it up, girl, um, June of 2020. And I was like, okay, I'm getting a sponsor. And I asked, I'm, I'm fairly young. And I asked the only other young person in the meeting I was at because she said, hi, I'm such and such. And I have, I haven't um, eaten compulsively in nine months. And I went, holy cow, that's a lifetime. You're sponsoring me. And so I, you know, I reached out to her and she started sponsoring me and she said, great, get a meal plan. And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, she said, okay, send your food to me every morning. Not going to do that either. Why don't you do the steps? Pass. But thank you so much for asking. Um, I'm really good, but I will call you every two days crying that I just ate $600 worth of Grubhub. But um, until then, we have nothing to talk about. So I didn't do anything that she said. I wasn't willing to go to any lengths. And um, because of that, I stayed sick. And what the, you know, I, and I, I wasn't working out of the big book, right? I wasn't like even looking, I was reading the OA literature and I was like, yeah, you know, and I was going to meetings and I was crying in a lot of meetings, but I wasn't doing anything really to take any sort of action um, to change my life. And that's like what I needed to do most. I, I, for me, like I needed to take the actions to change my life because there, I had a, I had a living problem and I needed so much help, so much help. And I wouldn't admit it because I had never said the words I'm wrong. I need help. And I don't know. I always had an answer for everything. I always had to know, right. I had to be the smartest, funniest, loudest person in the room to make up for me and how fundamentally wrong I felt. And, um, and so I was in this program for two months, not doing anything, not taking any action, giving you all lip service. And, um, and finally, you know, I had gotten this and I called my abstinence also no binging, right? I'm not going to binge, which is hilarious to me because saying that my abstinence is I'm not going to binge is like saying, I'm not going to breathe. Like I can, I have no control over that. Like I am, I am powerless. And, um, and finally, you know, I got like seven days, all I could ever do was put together one or two days. And then finally I got like seven days at the end of July. And I was like, this is it. 
I'm going to make it. And on the seventh night I binged and I woke up the next morning and I went, it's not going to work for me. Overeaters Anonymous is not going to work for me and nothing's going to work for me. And I just had this thought of like, I am going to die binging. I'm going to spend the rest of my life binging every single moment of my life. I'm going to, I'm going to binge until I'm like 90 years old, you know, if I even make it that long. And there's a lot of time left for me to be 90 years old. I was like, that's a lifetime of binging and I can't do it anymore. I can't do this with my weight, with the obsession, with thinking about food 24 seven. Like I finally just wanted peace, but I couldn't find it. So I, I planned it. You know, I was like, I'm going to go binge and use other substances and do those things until I die. Like I was like, I am going to kill myself because I can't live like this anymore. And that was the plan. I, I set out, I quit, I told my OA sponsor, I quit. And the plan was to kill myself. And so I started binging and, um, for three days, like all day long. And I spent $1,200 on food over the course of those three days. And, um, I couldn't get any sort of relief. Like it, the relief that I had once gotten from the food was gone. And um, it was terrifying that every single bite I took increased the terror and I could no longer get numb. And, um, and you know, on that, on August 5th of 2020, I woke up and said, I'm going to die. I'm definitely going to die if I keep going this way, but it's not going to do it fast enough. And at that point I was like, I either need to be dead or I need a new way of living. And um, I called somebody from the program and I told her, you know, that I was trying to kill myself and what I was doing. And, um, and she said, you know, come to my house and you're not leaving until you can go home without doing those things, you know? And um, she just, she just took literally just like brought me into her home I was living in Brooklyn. She was in Long Island. And the fact that I packed a bag with one change of clothes and a big book and got on a train to Long Island when I had never been there before was like a miracle, you know, but I was so terrified. I, I just, I knew if I stayed home in my apartment, locked in my bedroom, that I was just going to break down and order more and more food all day long. Cause that's what I'd been doing. And, um, and I, I called my sponsor and I, she was like, I was going to take on somebody else, but I just had this feeling you were to come back, you know, and that's another miracle. Right. And then I, I became willing to go to any lengths. Like it was in that moment where I was like, I'll do whatever. I'll just do whatever, whatever you tell me. Like, I don't know what's best for me. I have been so wrong and I need so much help. And I had never said any of that before. And it was like this insane humbling experience of like, okay, let's go. Let's do this. Like, because I knew that there was an, a life here for me because I saw all of you happy. And I heard you in meetings talking about how there was a solution. And you were talking about the big book and how everything that had led you up to that moment was exactly what needed to happen for you to be here. And, and I found that I could, I could have it too, if I wanted it. So I got a, I got a new sponsor, um, cause the sponsor I'd been working with and I kind of agreed that we wanted to be taken through the big book way. We didn't really know what that was, but we went to meetings and we heard people who worked their program out of the big book and they had like this insane, strong recovery. They were happy. They were helping. They were of service. There was no self-pity. It was just like, they were just like radiating. And I was like, I want to radiate. Like they look amazing. You know, they, they feel amazing and you can tell how happy they are through the screen. And I was miserable. So I was like, that's what I want. And, um, and she took me through this program with the big book and step one hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Like that moment waking up on August 5th, like that was my step one moment of like, I'm powerless. I cannot stop once I start and I can't stop from starting on my own. You know, I am completely powerless. I am a, a true compulsive overeater. And she took me through the doctor's opinion line by line. And I became convinced that if I did not do what was written in the big book, I would die. And then we worked on step two. And that was hard for me because I grew up having faith when I was really young. 
but kind of like this like vending machine faith of like, okay, God, if you're real, do this. If you're real, do this. And it was always like, you need to convince me that you're real. <laughs> and um, and so I, I just started studying we agnostics, you know, and taking notes and listening to whatever I could get my hands on. And I heard this great podcast where this woman was talking about how her higher power was like the GPS in a car. And um, she didn't need to know how it worked. She just needed to know that she'd get from point A to point B without getting lost. And at that point, I needed something to get me from point A to point B very badly because I had no clue where I was going. And I was taking notes at the time. I was listening to this and I just said, you know, I just I was writing and I, I wrote so weird, like my hand like did it without me even thinking. And it just said, I don't need to understand you, God, but I trust you. And when I did that, and it sounds so like bizarre, but like when I wrote that down, I had to stop for a second and like, and be like, whoa, is that true? Like, do I think that like this, this God that I know nothing of and is just like, just everywhere? Like, is, is that true? Do I believe in, in a, in a power greater than myself? And I realized it was, and I started crying. Like I had to turn off the podcast and put everything down. And I just started like really like viscerally weeping. And like, I was just like, oh my God. And it just, it just cracked over me. It was like the earth, like, like the sky shattered and like faith came in. And I felt like I was a child again. Like I had this, just this visceral image of like being in it, you know, like a baby and just being finally a child of God finally accepted for who I am. I'm no longer wrong. Right. Like it was this amazing experience. And, and from that day, the obsession to eat compulsively was removed. I had been abstinent for about three or four weeks at the time. Very like in a very difficult way though, you know, and that day it was gone. I didn't think about food anymore. And, um, and from that day, I knew something was changing. I took my third step. I did several fourth steps, several, because the first fourth step I did, I was a victim all over that thing. Like column, column four was all about how column two was so wrong, right? Like they really hurt me and I did not do anything to deserve this. And that was my first fourth step. And that obviously didn't work because, you know, three weeks later I was going into my eight and ninth step. And my sponsor was like, I was, I said to my sponsor, I don't know what my part is. <laughs> and then she was like, there's something wrong here. Like, if you can't see it, then you haven't really done a proper fourth step. So we did another one. And in that one, um, I, I could see it. You know, and I finally, and she like midwifed the hell out of that fourth step. She was like, well, don't you think that maybe this is about this? And I was like, yes, you're so right. And I, I just couldn't see it before because I was always a victim, right? It was always me against the world and how everyone was out to get me and how everyone was rejecting me or not accepting me. And that's why I acted the way I acted. And um, when I did my fifth step, you know, I um, I felt those promises really really suddenly, you know, the nearness of our creator and our, our fears falling from us, like it says in the book. And in six and seven, um, my sponsor had me write out all my character defects and answer all these questions about them, you know, which is kind of like more than the book does, but it was really helpful. And um, to see, you know, these defects and how they came out in my life and, and thinking about who am I with the defect and who am I without the defect, you know, and what does that look like? And um, in eight and nine, you know, uh, what and that like eight and nine is when we when I finally get out of the bubble of self. Right. Because this whole time, like I was in I was not working, you know, and I was just doing recovery. Like I was going to three meetings a day and calling every compulsive overeater I knew. And like I was just in this bubble of recovery. And then she said, OK, now go out and make amends to the people you've harmed. And I was like, Ugh, are you sure? leave this, you know, not I'm here, you know? And, um, she told me to pray and meditate on the first person I made amends to 
And it just kept coming up that it was my my former uh, manager at this this company I worked for that I thought was the problem, right? I quit that job because I was like, that's why I'm eating compulsively because I'm stressed. And I quit that job and nothing changed. And I was like, that's weird. Um, but I had this manager that I was um, this manager that I was really crappy to, and um, in lots of ways. And I reached out to him. I texted him. And I said, hey. I'm in a recovery program and, and I need to make amends to you. You know, will you let me know when you're available? And he didn't answer for a day. And I'm like, oh my God, he's telling everyone that I'm in a 12 step program and they're all laughing at me and everyone knows now. And they're like, that makes sense why she was so terrible. <laughs> and, and, you know, he, he messages me back after a day and he's like, He's like, you need to make amends to me. I need to make amends to you. And it turns out that my manager had 36 years in AA. And, um, and so we, met, we talked for an hour about, you know, the 10th and 11th step after I made amends to him and he made amends to me. And um, when I made amends to my parents, you know, my dad said to me, Katie, you are the happiest I've seen you since you were a little girl. And just the miracles upon miracles. And then 10 and 11, for me, you know, my morning practice is really important. Um, my evening practice, you know, I, I do the nightly review that's in the, the big book on page 86. Yes, page 86. And um, in the morning, I, I get up, I get on my knees, I pray, I um, meditate for 10 minutes. I do two-way prayer. Um, almost every morning. And I feel weird if I don't do it now. Um, and I try to spend time all day long talking to God. And um, what worked for me really early on is I started talking. I, for me, my higher power is just love. Like that's just it. It's, it's not defined by anything. It's just like God, which is just love. And it's just in everything and every, everyone. And, you know, it says in the big book, God is either everything or he is nothing. And for me, like I had to start really looking at God as everything. Like God is this potato I'm holding in my hand. And God is like you talking to me right now. God is like the street light that like, I'm in a huge rush, but the street light won't change because I need to be humbled and be patient. And I just had to look at everything as being an offshoot of my higher power. And, um, and so I talk to God all day long and um, I'm just like, hey, buddy, I'm really freaked out right now. Or like, hey, I'm doing this. Hey, what do you think? You know, just and just trying to keep that prayer, you know, always in me, because for me, like. My God needs to be a God I can always get to. Right. I learned really early on in this program that one day there's going to be nothing between me and a compulsive bite than my higher power. Nobody's going to answer the phone. There will not be a meeting and it will be me and a slice of chocolate cake. And I will need to have a higher power at that moment or else I'm pretty screwed. Um, so in about, you know, the 10th step, like clearing the wreckage is super important because if I'm blocked, like I'm definitely going to say something shitty to my sister almost always like my sister really pushes my buttons. So if I'm blocked from God, I am totally going to lash out and be like, you know, and we just don't need that. And my life today, I have to be free from resentment, selfishness, self-pity, dishonesty, um, have to, because anytime I am like I'm far away. And if my solution today is my higher power, then like, I gotta be close. And, uh, the 12th step really quickly, cause I think I have talked for 30 minutes. Uh, um, the 12th step is, is so important. And, um, giving this thing away, you know, it's, it's the debt that I pay to the women who have taken me through the 12 steps and have, have cared for me, answered my phone calls, heard me cry, you know, taken my fifth steps. It's a debt that I pay forward and working with others is amazing. And it is, it is, um, life-changing, you know, and for me, I'm 25 years old. Um, I started sponsoring someone who, uh, it, was 18 when we started start working together and is now 19 and watching them recover in college and give this away to somebody else was a miracle to me like 18 years old 
and, and doing this program out of the big book, working their ass off, going to school and giving it away, you know, and um, all of us do this imperfectly, every single one of us. And we all work abstinence in different ways. And um, every single one of us has a right to be here. And, and our stories matter, you know, everything that's ever happened to me needed to happen to me so I could be here with you and tell you my story. And hopefully someone on this line has a better day because they heard something in my share and said, yeah, I'm just like that. And I belong here. So um, if you're here, thank you. You know, like, thank you for being here because I can't have a meeting without you. I can't have, you know, I can't be in a 12 step program without somebody else. You know, I, I need you guys. And um, I hope, oh, I hope you stay. I will do my best to stay also. And um, thank you for letting me. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Katie, thanks for that extraordinary share of your experience, strength and hope. Man, what a lovely journey. Um, just uh, one thing I uh, from the big book on page 381 from the story, Winner Takes All. I've already told you about some of the miracles that have happened. However, there's more. I want to tell you how I feel inside. I'm no longer spiritually bankrupt. It's as if I have a magic source in my life that has provided me with all I need. Um, I just celebrated my 12th year of sobriety a couple months ago. When I first came to OA, just substitute uh, uh, AOA, I didn't know who I was. My sponsor said, great. If you don't know who you are, you can become whoever God or your higher power wants you to be. So thank you so much, Katie. And uh, wow, thanks. <laughs>